so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Phoebe Stevens. I just wanted to welcome you on behalf of the Canadian Association of Food Studies to today's webinar. Um, today, we're fortunate enough to get a chance to hear from two prominent food studies scholars, Drs. Michael Carolyn and Kelly Bronson, um, and they're going to cover a wide range of issues related to critical agrarian studies. Um, so the format will be conversational. Um, between Kelly and Michael. They'll talk for about 45 minutes to an hour, and then that will be followed with a Q&A period. Um, and I also wanted to note that this is the second webinar in a new series that's hosted by the Canadian Association of Food Studies. And we're aiming to host a handful of these webinars throughout the year um, on a variety of food-related topics um, to engage scholars and practitioners. And um, if you're interested in being looped into this community, please consider becoming a member um, and joining our listserv. So you'll be kept up to date um, on these types of events and other things that are going on related to food studies in Canada. Um, so with that said, I'd like to formally introduce today's speakers. Um, so first we have Dr. Michael Carolyn, who's a professor of sociology and associate dean of research and faculty development for the College of Liberal Arts at Colorado State University. And um, other appointments include Distinguished Fulbright Research Chair at the University of Ottawa, Visiting Professor at the Ruralis Research Institute in Trondheim, Norway, and Research Affiliate at the Center for Sustainability at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Um, he's published over 250 peer-reviewed articles and more than a dozen books. And he regularly writes pieces for public audiences as he works to bridge the town-gown divide. So some of these pieces have appeared in outlets like The Conversation, Bloomberg, Mental Floss, The Houston Chronicle, San Francisco Chronicle. Um, there's a whole list, Popular Science and the New Food Economy. So feel free to check those out. Um, and we are also joined today by Dr. Kelly Bronson, who holds a Canada Research Chair in Science and Society in Sociology at the University of Ottawa. Um, she has a close affiliation to the Institute for Science, Society and Policy, um, and as well as the Center for Law, Technology and Society. She studies and intervenes um, into science society tensions that are wrapped around technologies such as GMOs, fracking, big data and AI, um, and their governance. So she has a particular interest in food technologies and food justice issues. And Dr. Bronson aims to bring community values into conversation with technical knowledge in the production of evidence-informed decision-making. So her policy experience involves advising government um, and she has served on expert panels um, like the Council of Canadian Academies on plant health risk. Um, she's funded by the, Soci or the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, as well as a variety of private foundations. And she's also published work in regional, national, and international journals, and frequently gets called on to mobilize findings in public settings from Café Scientifique to mainstream media like TVO's The Agenda. And also to note that she's set to publish a book sometime in 2021 with McGill Queens um, on the subject of digital agriculture. So as you can see, these are two very impressive and no doubt busy people. So thank you so much, Kelly and Michael, for being here with us today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation and I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thanks Phoebe. And thanks everyone for attending. I know I'm speaking for both of us and I think accurately when I say we're really pleased to be here. And I wanted to do one thing right out of the gate, which is thank Fulbright Canada because partly what enables Michael and I to interact with one another and to do events like this is support from Fulbright Canada. Michael is currently at <laughs> the University of Ottawa as a Fulbright, uh, visiting Fulbright scholar. Um, okay, I was gonna light a little fire behind me <laughs> in the spirit of this fireside chat, but I'm, I'm wondering whether that background might actually just be distracting. So I, um, I have my warm beverage though, Michael. The facilitator. Nice. Where's yeah, yours? Yeah, this is a. I uh, <laughs> mine is mine is actually iced because I I oh. work on it solely over the course of the day and after it sits for too long it tastes terrible so I put it on ice. Okay. Yeah, this is a poor substitute for what we had hoped would be a a very face to face personal sort of uh, set of conversations we were going to have over the course of this whole calendar year and that just didn't happen at all. Best laid plans. I know. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to begin with a funny little story, which is when uh, Phoebe and David first 
asked um, about your potentially presenting and I kind of wrote up a little description. I labeled you in the description of a possible event, a rural sociologist. And I sent the description to you and, and you kind of balked a little bit. And you said, well, why don't we call me instead a critical agri-food studies scholar? And I wondered if, and you and I had a really interesting back and forth on that. And I thought we could have that. We could kind of rehearse that again in front of everyone else because I think it's really telling. Do you want to just talk for a brief moment about, about that, those labels and, and why you, what the distinction is for you between rural sociologist and critical agri-food studies scholar? Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. And my answer will, will undoubtedly be different this time than when we first talked about it, Kelly, because it's still something I'm kind of reflecting on. Um, you know, I, I embrace the term rural sociology amongst other rural sociologists. But then when we when we get out of that subfield, then sometimes I do. I haven't quite fully understood why that is, but I sometimes I don't I don't f as fully embrace the term. I think part of it has to do with, and this is kind of why I've been so attracted to whether we call it critical food studies or critical agri-food studies. Sometimes I like the agri-food studies over just the food studies because I I also believe it's really important to understand all aspects of food, which is you know personally what attracts me to the to studying food as a as a social scientist and. I guess this gets to the point that we've done, we as the critical food studies community have done such an amazing job troubling the term food that no one would ever think, no no one thinks that's, that's involved in this conversation would think, oh, they're just talking about the materiality or the, the food as a static thing, right? We've, we, we've done such a good job of troubling it and thinking about it relationally and thinking about how it connects up with the environments and, issues related to ethnicity and the performativity of everyday life and power and neoliberalism and, and greed and profit and on and on and on and on. And so it's a fun term, it's a fun space to be in because it is so troubled. Sometimes the term rural sociologist or even an, an urban study scholar, I get a, a bit uncomfortable sometimes with both of those literatures. Although in both cases, there are scholars doing amaz ama amazing Kind of relational work that are truly troubling those concepts too. But then there's also quite a bit of scholarship that rural is understood in a very Euclidean way, I guess, in a sense of thinking about it in, in very three-dimensional spatial terms. And urban is, a, is, is thought about very similarly. And, and I, that's what attracts me to the, the rural piece is because it helps. I want to trouble the concept of rural like we've mm -hmm. all troubled the concept of food. And in doing that, also trouble the concept of urban. Um, and I haven't quite, I'm sure we'll talk about this later and I'll talk more about all of this when, when I'm sure when we have more conversations over the course of the next hour, but I'm not quite sure how to think about those terms rural and urban either, but I guess I'm not quite sure how to think about the term, the concept of food either. We're not, you know, it's strange when we talk about rural and urban People want to know what it what it means. While when we we can talk about food, and none of the thirty four participants here would expect either of us to come up with a a static, black and white definition of what food means either. And so I don't know. That's just a yeah free flowing thought of all I love it. the things I <laughs> grapple with, Kelly, when we talk about those terms. <laughs> no, I love it. I'm going to pick up on two things. One, it is first, even though, you know, food studies over the last, what, 30 years has done such a good job of broadening perspectives on food, right, beyond the material or the technical aspects. I don't know if you get this, but if I tell people, which in certain circles I do, oh, I'm a food studies scholar, um, I often get the question, well, what should I eat for breakfast, right? Like, what, sure. What's healthy? What, what, <laughs> I have to say, no, no, I'm not a nutrition scientist. I mean, I have a background in plant biology, but um, not nutrition science and certainly not human, human, uh, human biology. And so, and so, yeah, I have to say, no, no, I take a broad perspective, right? I, I, I look at food in all of its social kind of relations, right, from a food systems perspective. And so I, I still think even though as an academic community, we've done a lot of work, I wonder how broadly that vision of food 
um, circulates. But, you know, I was thinking that your idea of troubling, right, troubling these representations or labels. And, and really what I hear you saying is, you know, and I see this actually across all of your work, and I think it's one of the reasons we kind of struck up a friendship um, and collegial relationship three years ago is I think we share this in common, which is uh, we have this in common. We share this maybe what kind of political motivation to trouble putative boundaries, right? Between nature right. and culture, between urban and rural. Um, so it's not just seeing things in their broader perspective, but also troubling, troubling the boundaries. Right. Um, and I would add to that too, Kelly, um, troubling what it means to be an academic and our own role in the academy as well. Um, you know, I guess as a formally trained sociologist, although sometimes I actually identify more with geographers and other fields, just because I'm even uncomfortable identifying, you know, with a particular discipline, because I really want to feel like I can engage with multiple communities simultaneously. But, you know, in, the, in sociology, one of our, you know, our core founders is Marx and the idea of it's not enough to just study the world, but to change it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, you know, I, I engage with critical scholars too, that, you know, is it, is it enough just to be critical or do we have some sort of obligation to dabble in trying to come up with understandings of what's, I don't want to say prescriptive because that makes people uncomfortable. And there's a lot of reasons why being prescriptive is, is troubling too. But asking the question of can we can we engage in scholarship that helps us make sense of what practices are better than others or what practices are more emancipatory rather than just critiquing for critique in itself, which I think part of it, part of my hesitancy to just go down that lane is as an educator too. I've spent now a couple decades in the classroom and I've learned, I learned a long time ago that if you just critique, you stand up there and critique, you enable a sense of powerlessness, um, a sense of depression, a sense of dread in your students, a sense that there's just nothing we can do. I, I had a critical scholar once tell me resistance is futile. And so what's the point of, of what we do if that's the case? And so I'm, I'm struggling with, with what it means to be a, a critical scholar. I mean, so in doing that, that's something else I have been trying to trouble too. <laughs> Is the critical. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. You know, I was going to ask you, you know, I, I think from the very beginning, actually, so, you know, people probably know this, and I just said this, I have this background in biology, but I was not a very good biologist. You know, I have two degrees in plant biology, but I always found myself wandering into the like philosophy of biology section or reading the environmental historians like Bill Cronin right, whose wonderful book, Nature's Metropolis, does that kind of troubling between nature and culture. And yet, I think like you, and so this is something else we share, that troubling for me is not an esoteric or theoretical exercise, but actually it's grounded in me wanting to make the world a better place, which sounds really flaky. But um, so I know like through your methods, and I do want to ask you more about your unique kind of interventionist, empirical sociological methods in a second, but how do you see those this troubling as an exercise in getting beyond the academy, as, a, as an exercise in being critical of, of just critical, as in just negative offering no solutions. Like, or, or this is a better way of asking the question maybe, why do those labels, what do those labels do sometimes that can, can do, you know, do negative things in the world? Why, why are you against those, those labels at times, even though, as you said before, they can be productive. Say you're at a rural sociology conference, it makes sense to call yourself a rural sociologist. You're on the editorial team for a well-known rural so sociology <laughs> um, academic journal. And so those labels can be really productive for academic right. communities, but how can they be unproductive um, right. in, that, in that aim to making the world a better place? Can you say a bit about that? Yeah, no, that's, I mean, it's a good point. Um, we, we talk about in, in our respective fields, the importance of decentering and looking at concepts in different ways. Um, but in the, in the same respect, by centering on a concept, it also helps highlight something. So, you know, centering on the concept of rural helps me, keeps me in check so that when we talk about say urban agriculture or we talk about smart cities or things like that to 
always realize that there's other elements, relationally speaking, that we always need that we need to, that we need to think about in those concepts. And so, I guess the short answer is just simply, the concepts are important because even in themselves, they create they they shine a spotlight on certain things, but also they create an immense amount of blind spots too. Because with any light, light light is light because it also creates absence and darkness. And so, as long as you can realize that a spotlight simultaneously and always is illuminating and hiding and masking and creating shadows, then you can start working through that and always being being cognizant of that. And so even, I mean, if you think about even being critical, I guess in some respects being critical can both shine a spotlight, but also create absences that we also need to think about. And we have to ask ourselves, what are we missing by being purely critical, or what are we missing by purely focusing on X first and Y? And so I kind of try to always go through that exercise intellectually and with my students so that I can try to be as honest and, and open and, and free to experiment. And I realize part of it too now as a, as a full professor and, and more senior, um, I have certain freedoms that perhaps other junior scholars don't have. Um, but I try, I try to empower my graduate students to think in a similar way and to break break from those those chains of our respective disciplines that are very disciplining in some ways as mm -hmm. well, which is another reason why I'm always reluctant to identify with a particular discipline, realizing that in doing that, I'm disciplining how I can think about the world. Absolutely. And who you speak to, right? Right. Um, right. Yeah, I think we share that in common, too. We're both, in a way, intellectual omnivores. <laughs> <laughs> Some would say indiscriminate, maybe, but you know, one of my favorite papers of yours, Michael, probably, I'm just guessing, but nobody here, um, if it's food studies scholars here, knows about, and it actually is in a way about this, the sort of the bright spots and the blind spots is the name of the article of science, right? right. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, that's almost exactly the answer I would have given had you asked me that question. Why do you do this work to trouble boundaries and labels, right? And discursive conventions. Um, and for me, it's that it's, you know, they're really, they can be really functional. Calling yourself a rural sociologist and always going to the same community meetings can be really functional to, to for that community, academic community, for the development of knowledge, for your own career. But but when you're labeling or when you're using a label or a distinction or when you're doing a particular kind of scholarship from a particular disciplinary position, you're always shining light in one direction and there's other things that are excluded, right? People who, communities who are excluded or ideas or, you know, thinking about how, you know, people in positions like yours and like mine, we might be enabled or empowered to do this kind of troubling work, right? It, it, it's really difficult to ask a, a student, for example, to do this kind of work. But in a way, I, I, so I teach a class, a sociology class called research design. It's not a methods class, but it's sort of like, what are approaches to research, right? Frameworks, or um, I teach it using Andrew Abbott's heuristics for the social sciences, which is a really, it's an old text now, but it's quite a goodie. And he gives gambits, right? Like chess moves. What are some kind of intellectual gambits or moves that scholars can play to think about things in unique ways, right? And one of them he calls the reversal heuristic. And it's kind of, I think, what you and I pull a lot of the time, right? Everyone in rural sociology, so take my family farm paper, which is published in Journal of Rural Studies, which you're on the editorial team for, you know, in that I kind of say, look at rural sociologists talk about the family farm this way, how do family farmers talk about it? How can we talk about it or think about it in a, a different way? And that's the reversal heuristic. And in a way it's kind of, it just gives a name to that, to that troubling work that we do. And I think it actually can be quite useful for students, albeit a bit frightening, um, but yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, that's lovely. So, I, I guess I forgot about that te that text in, it's an in, old in promoting one, but, that. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it sort of gives a name to some of these tricks that I, I think that we perform often unconsciously, right? As academics. Right. And that's another that's another good point too that we always think we're coming up with something new in yeah. many respects. If you just dig far enough, someone else did it. Maybe even did it better in the in the past. So always be. Always be mindful of that. <laughs> or is doing it now. Just this morning, right. I yeah, I made a connection with someone who's doing similar work. Well, when you and I first connected, what was that, four years ago? 
Yeah. Um, how did I realize you were doing work on digital agriculture? I don't remember, but I wrote to you and I said, hey, I hear that you're sort of moving into this space. And I'm kind of moving into this space. And, and I said, this is a project I'm just starting. And here's my main kind of problematic or interest. And you said, hey, that's, you were a bit, you were farther ahead than me. You had sort of already done some field work. And you said, that's exactly my interest. And yeah. so, yeah, someone could be doing the same work as you right, at the same right. time. And then we had that interesting experience at that conference where we experienced some troubling going on firsthand, right? With uh, Yeah. Uh, you want to, you want to talk about that? real quickly, right? In terms sure. of going to this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so um, for those listening, Michael and I, well, I was asked to organize a panel at a big data conference. So this is, you know, a lively community of folks interested in critical data studies, speaking of critical. So folks that trouble, right? The uses, misuses of social media data, for example, and health data and, you know, the AI, the critical AI folks, the well-known people like Dana Boyd and Kate Crawford. And the main speaker was, oh, what's his name? Who talks, anyway, I'll think of it in just a second. So really well-known keynote speaker. And we, we organized this panel on agriculture. And, um, oh, thanks, David, the Brighton Blind Spots. Yeah, that's that great article by Michael. It's probably going to make him embarrassed. It's maybe not one of, I don't know if you, I love it. Um, but, but yeah, we organized this panel on agricultural data, right? And di digital and all things digital or ICTs in relation to agriculture. And this conference that was otherwise, the rooms were packed. And what, like four people came to our <laughs> panel, including the, the, the IT support folks. It was like tumbleweeds flowing through them. <laughs> oh, and you're a very well-known scholar. And I was just shocked. But yeah, I think it has to do with these disciplinary, right? I, um, mm -hmm. I think to this day, data studies folks don't think about food studies or farming. And right. yeah, um, maybe because yep. of all sorts of assumptions about not only food studies, but also about farming or farmers as parochial and folksy and not innovative. And what does big data and AI have to do with farming? Well, a heck of a right. lot. Maybe we'll get to that <laughs> later when we talk about our books. <laughs> I wanna ask you about methods. Um, because, you know, so we have the shared interest in representation, we might call it. I said labels, but language and what things are called and trying to get at, you know, the meanings of representation and underneath the representations and, you know, and trying to actually make visible, I think, in, in the, some of the unique methods you've used, the, unrep the seemingly unrepresentable or the things that we don't say or that we don't acknowledge. And so do you want to just talk about some of your neat methods that you've used for representing the unrepresentable or, or making visible? Yeah, no, I, I'd, I'd be happy to. And, in, you know, this it's no secret. So Kelly and I talked ahead of time a bit about how this is going to unfold. So I actually have a few slides that I'm going to share. So this yeah, will feel maybe great. a little more lecture format, but to, to get it, it'd be easier to show you than to tell you, which has a history in representational theory in and of itself, showing rather than telling. But I mean, part of part of it, Kelly is, you know, there's this great saying in the embodied knowledge literature, um, we know more than we can tell. Um, and I like the phrase because it, it reminds us there's kind of representational limits to science and the scientific enterprise, which is, you know, simply to say, as you point out, that words and numbers can only go so far into knowing and explaining social life. And so, you know, this is where my, my experimental spirit kind of comes and trying to come up with creative ways methodologically to represent, representatively capture what is to some degree unrepresentable or uncapturable by just using words um, or numbers. And so what I, I'm gonna try to do here, are you seeing that Kelly? Okay, great. Maybe. Oh yeah, I love these. Do you call them yeah, heat, some heat, heat maps? maps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So part of it is actually with my role as associate dean for research, I help enable a lot of different type of scholarship, and I've been turned on to the digital humanities and the power of different ways of visualizing data, which I've kind of adopted as well because I find them really a fascinating way of trying to to capture or get at aspects of the social our social realities in ways that 
that just don't seem that the that the face to face interview just doesn't seem to get at. And the best way of explaining this is just by giving some very quick examples talking about I think I'll, I'm going to talk about three specific papers. So this first one, Kelly, is comes from a recently published piece in a journal Climatic Change. And it draws from a very large, I call it an ethnographic study of Colorado. And I call it that because I've interviewed more than 300 individuals in the state of Colorado from every county. And I've, I've engaged in hundreds of hours of participant observation, um, both in rural and in urban settings. And the research is still continuing. Um, but what I'm trying to do in this particular, these data, or try to get at and interrogate what you might call cultural values that are held by respondents. And of course, and there's a whole literature on cultural values that if folks are interested in learning more about, they can read this particular paper or just Google cultural values and there's, there's plenty to read on it. But of course you just can't ask somebody, what are your cultural values? You have to think creatively and there are survey methods out there that try to, to, to gauge where people are at in terms of their own cultural values. But I tried, to do something else. And so what I tried to do is I created this, it, part of my survey instrument had a question, had two questions. One of the questions was what most contributes to one reaching their fullest potential and in society, community, or the individual. Um, and again, there's reasons for this that are based upon my reading of this cultural value literature. Um, but then I asked, I handed people a piece of paper and I asked them to locate on that image, um, kind of a dot of where, how they would answer the question. So as opposed to say, creating a Likert scale or something like that, I wanted people to kind of visually locate where their, where their feelings are when it comes to answering this question, realizing that it's just not so simple that someone would say, oh, I'm all about community, I'm all about the individual, I'm all about society. Um, and so then what I did with that is then I fed those, I converted those data points into two dimensional, two dimensional data and I fed it into heat mapping software and this is, this is the, the result of that. And, and so it's, it's curious how, you know, people might not be familiar with the term frontier county. The frontier county is a, a term that's been created by the United States government. And it really refers to counties that are very frontier-esque. And their specific definition is counties with a population of density or six or fewer persons for, per square mile. So very kind of isolated, very rural maybe communities. And I won't get into how I'm interpreting this data, but it's really kind of interesting how the heat map looks different if you're talking about respondents from a frontier community, a rural community, or from um, the, the urban front range corridor where that Denver kind of anchors in the center. And then the next thing I did is I asked them the question, now answer this, answer the question essentially, but from the perspective of, let me forward it, from how you would think someone from the an alternative metropolitan classification. So if you're a rural person, how do you think someone living in Denver would answer this question and, and vice versa, which is in and of itself, I think kind of original because we often ask people how they perceive things, but we don't often ask people how they perceive others' perceptions of things, which, you know, living in this crazy society that we live in today, especially in the United States with Trumpism, but I mean, other countries are going through the same thing. People have wild understandings of how the other, the other political tribe or the, the, the other category think about the world. And often those understandings or perceptions are way off base. And it's kind of interesting how um, people kind of stereotyped in some respects, rural pe people stereotyped urban folks when it comes to answering this question and, and, and vice versa too. So, so that's the one. The other thing I wanted to talk about. Oops. So I, some people might be familiar with this. They came, this came out about two years ago in the Journal of Rural Sociology. And this is where I employed some word clouds. And I think I used this at a talk in Ottawa as well, Kelly. So you've probably seen this before too. Um, you but this to that data power talk. <laughs> oh, that's right. I did. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So I was kind of inspired by this by Raymond Williams, the, the critical literary um, theorist. He wrote a book, famous book called Keywords, and just talk about how certain words are ways, if we can interrogate words and how people understand words, they rep, they're kind of like eyes to the one soul and that we can really understand through people's understanding of their of keywords, 
people's fundamental kind of political ontologies about the world, or maybe you'd say worldview or something like that. And so the, the empirical cases for this study were a group of um, farmers in North Dakota and ag professionals and a group of uh, urban farmer cooperative members. And we were talking about some sensitive political issues with the urban farmer cooperative members. And so I promise not to divulge the city, um, but you know, it, it consisted of urban activists, um, uh, mostly non-white um, uh, individuals uh, living in uh, communities of lower socioeconomic status. Um, and so it's a very different group of people demographically speaking as well. And I, I just asked them the question, um, select three terms describing what autonomy means to you and select three terms that describes what um, social justice means to you. And then before having them give me their answer to those questions, I presented them with a list of roughly 50 words for both terms. And, and the terms on that list were, were already defined. So I wanted to try to fix in the terms that they were drawing from at least. And I, we had a conversation about what the definitions mean. So everyone was more or less on the same page. Um, and then they gave me their response and I fed their responses then into this word cloud software. And it's just kind of interesting how wildly different people's understandings of terms that we freely toss about um, how wildly different they were. The social justice one is quite stark. Um, I won't um, editorialize, you all can read the paper, but you can see what words came up and how they differed greatly between groups. This is the social justice word cloud. And then the autonomy word cloud is just as stark. Um, and I guess if we were to talk about it in kind of cultural value terms to refer back to the prior slide, you know, the, the idea of individualism um, holds high and the one uh, for North Dakota and the urban farmer cooperative perhaps would flow more along the lines of a collectivist sort of cultural value orientation if we were to use that dichotomy. Uh, thinking about the importance of interdependence as a way of expressing one autonomy. This is kind of the thinking it came out of the qualitative. This is why the qualitative interviews were so important because it further informs these word clouds. They talked about how you can do more in collaboration with others. And so in some respects, it gives you freedom. It gives you autonomy by actually working with others and collaborating. It allows you to do more things. And so just a real interesting understanding about people's views of the world and their understanding of how it is and how it ought to be and how they're very different. And then the last thing I wanted to just mention briefly, Kelly, and this is a paper that just came out in Agriculture and Human Values. And um, I did something quite a bit different. I was been inspired by how some geographers have been using kind of um, mapping and tracking data um, to understand people's mobilities and to, to help decenter the concept of things like food access, um, food equity. And so um, part of this involved, it involved three different communities, um, one very metro and two rural. One rural was located in the plains of Colorado and the one located more in cent central Colorado, that's where the Rocky Mountains are. So it's incredibly mountainous um, terrain. And I had them upload actually a tracking app on their phone. Um, it's called Prey, P-R-E-Y. And I use that because it allowed the individuals to con entirely control their own tracking data. And the only way I could have a look at it was after the study period was over and they granted me access if they had, after they had a chance to look it over themselves. And then when the study was done and I extrapolated what I needed to, they had full access over it and they could delete it or do what they want. And there was absolutely no way for me to continue tracking them once the study was over. Um, but I, but I was really interested in trying to think about how people engage in issues of food procurement, um, food mobility, as we think through, there's this field called kind of critical mapping studies increasingly in geography that helps us talk about issues of food access um, as it relates to issues around food procurement and food equity and inequities. And so, you know, one thing that I, I found really interesting, so what I talk about in this paper is I talk about it helps us kind of trouble this understanding of food access, or I talk about how it gives us a relational understanding of food access. And just to give you kind of a flavor of what I mean by this, um, so this figure two contains two images from the same household. Um, it's from the metropolitan sample. 
And it's adults worked in a, and I, I included all adults in a household because I realized food procurement can be very gendered and can be very otherwise. And I wanted to make sure I captured all the adults in the household when I was trying to understand how a household accesses its food. And so in this particular household, as in many, the people lived in one community, but they commuted to another community to work. They didn't live in that other community because the real estate prices were cost prohibitive, but it often describes kind of the increasing commuter society that we live in, at least in more affluent nations, and especially in the United States. And it's interesting, there's this term called anchoring in food mapping literature. Of course, when we talk about food mapping and talking about distances people are from where they get their food, we have to make some assumptions. And one of the assumptions are di distances from where. And often that from where is an individual's house when we're talking about mapping a food, a food landscape. And typically we're talking about an urban food landscape. There's not a lot of literature that talks about mapping rural food landscapes. And so what I wanted to do with this study is kind of trouble that anchor of the house and think about how, how do people actually procure their food? And what I found with this research is that often what people do is they tie their food procurement trips, they anchor it to other things other than the house. Maybe they anchor it to work, where the, after work they purchase their food from a grocery store. And what you see and what tended to be the case in this particular study is while people bought their food in, in places that were quite a ways away from their house, in this particular case, 40 miles away for this home, they were buying it from a store that was right by where one of the individuals worked. And so from one perspective, it was actually quite a distance to get their food if you anchor it to the home, but if you anchor food distance to work, it actually wasn't very far. And so just another way of troubling how we think about issues around food access. Um, and then the differences between rural and urban as well. Um, and, and, and so for this one, Kelly, you'll notice the metropolitan mobilities, when we anchor it to work and we think about food mobility as something that's done in conjunction with work, you, <clears throat> you get this one violin graph, what's called a violin graph. But if you think about food mobility as only those times where food is purchased where the home is the anchor, then typically what happens is, and I don't want to elaborate too much more on what particular, how these different things are conceptualized because I realize we're short on time, but how we anchor things and how we think about food mobility can produce very different maps. And of course, as critical tarcographers remind us, all maps lie and we have to be mindful of that and we have to always unpack the assumptions that go in the maps. And then what's particularly interesting with the Metro is how the, the violin graphs are very different. And so with the home anchor, you see this great distance. So, and so in this particular case, this was the mountain community. And when people did leave home only to go on a trip to get food, it was often a trip to what we call the front range or close to Fort Collins where I live, a very, very long distance trip to the nearest Costco. And, and so for many of these individuals, when they access their food, we could talk about food access for these mountainous communities in terms of just their own community as if it was this enclosed box in Euclidean space, thinking that that's where people get their food. But many, for many of these rural communities for supply chain reasons and other ways, even if you were to create um, multiple food options within the mountainous communities, people would still choose, and I always put that in quotes, to drive those longer distances to go to the Costco in part for economic reasons, but there's also social reasons that draw them to those other metropolitan spaces too. So it's just a, um, this is just a taste for what I think, what, what that paper really does when it comes to troubling a lot of different concepts when we think about issues related to food procurement and food access. And just the last thing that the paper highlights too is the importance of um, life course too is something I found out. Um, you know, there's, there's increasingly a, a growing amount of literature that's talking about food access and the need to anchor it to someplace other than the house when we're talking about food mobilities. But typically that makes the argument that we need to also anchor it to work. But that is in some case biased to people who are still of age who are working or people who are actually working. And it missed all the other sort of life experiences people have who perhaps might be retired, for instance. And so one interesting thing I found out too is that food mobility looks and food procurement looks very different depending upon if the household say has young children 
versus if the household is full of retirees. And then suddenly those anchors change drastically. And so this is just all to say, again, troubling the idea of food access by thinking about new ways in which how we can kind of interrogate people's social lives and understand their social lives, and in part using other types of data. And I'm not, this is clearly representational data. This is GPS tracking data. But then also the importance of kind of layering data too. So layering it involving face-to-face -face interviews, layering it with perhaps creative ways that could invoke heat maps or layering it in ways that maybe might utilize GPS tracking technology in a way that's respectful of people's privacy and seeing if we can come up with new narratives or create new bright spots in places where previously we had um, blind spots and thinking also how we might be able to even incorporate technology in, 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 um, in experimental ways that might allow us to interrogate things that we wouldn't have been able to interrogate before. And so, let me see, I think that it yeah, was a great. very long answer to your question. <laughs> I apologize, no, that's great. but I think it's useful. <laughs> no, no, it's it's so useful. I um I was thinking when you said that your 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 a comment that maps are a kind of lie. I mean, one way of saying it is well, it makes me think of that um, Cyrano de Bergerac quotation, right? A lie is a kind of myth, and a myth is a kind of truth. So I wouldn't say that maps or models or words or labels like we were talking about before lie, but as you said, they make some things visible and they're therefore necessarily make other things less visible, right? They're partial, they're representations. Um, yep. So I like the, sa the same way that you're doing this visualization, you know, you're, you're making visible, but then one th thing, and I don't know if you would agree that this is a sort of tactic or maybe gambit that you use, but it seems that you create maps and then you actually kind of shift the perspective and look at the map or create a, a map from a slightly different perspective. So with the heat maps, right, getting people, charting people's responses on, on the heat map, getting them to assume the other's responses, charting that on a heat map. And I almost think of like a crystal metaphor, right? Rather than looking at something from just one angle, right? Where it, you know, light is refracted in one particular direction. It seems to me that in a lot of your work, whether it's with words or whether it's with these visualization techniques and mapping um, methods, you then you represent and then you kind of shift things a little bit to represent from a slightly different perspective. It seems to me that there's a kind of similarity or a thread we can pull through your work, um, the kind of work that you do in troubling labels to the kind of work that you do in visualizing, but then kind of complicating or troubling those visualizations. I also thought, you know, when you were talking about Raymond Williams and the, the, the word clouds and inspired by keywords, I wondered if sort of circling back again to our previous conversation about urban and rural, whether you know of his book, Country and City, The Country and the City. I do, yeah. I, it was in the graduate school when I rest led it though, so please don't ask me a question about oh, it. Oh no, I won't, I was just thinking I dropped that because people know about keywords, but they don't often know about that book, Country and the City, and it's such a good book. And I remembered for those who were paying attention before, um, the key speaker at that keynote speaker at Data Power, who's such a big name, Paul Edwards. Oh, right. That's who gave right. the keynote talk. So this was a really big conference. And again, yeah, nobody attended this panel that we that we um, that we organized <laughs> on agriculture. There was very right. little interest in data and agriculture. And Just to your methods, Michael, all of these empirical methods. So I know you have a new book coming out, right? With with mm -hmm. um, Stanford. Yeah. And my sense about this new book is that it it's kind of you, the sort of thesis or the argument for the book you arrived at by kind of looking across all your methods, right? Sort of you, you know, you kind of almost did an informal meta analysis of the methods of these sort of empirical methods that, that you've used where food or engagement with food was at the center. And I feel like you can't, you've come to an interesting conclusion about what, engagement with food can do not just can reveal right or can do maybe i'll say do that's a more active word not just for researchers but for participants and do you want to you talk about democracy do you want to just say a little bit about that yeah yeah i will well so yeah i do have a i finally got the okay from stanford university press and the book will be coming out next year um and you're right kelly i mean a lot of my work is very inductive and it based upon prior stuff that I've done. And 
I guess in, in this respect, that's why the, the book is really based on the, the fundamental idea that we inhabit worlds very differently. And I think it's really important to stress it, that it's, and I think clearly in the world we live in, especially in the United States, but I also know elsewhere, um, that, you know, this is the worlds we inhabit is, are not just about differing opinions, right? And that's what makes it so difficult is that people on the other side of the political aisle or other on the other side of the social aisle seem to be really inhabiting in some respects entirely different worlds, which makes it so frustrating for some people. And, you know, I think Remember this, that this, you're in the U.S. and you started this book um, when Trump was in power. I think that's an right, interesting part of this right, puzzle. Right? That's interesting. right. So, I mean, it, it, that out, kind of further creates an impetus for me to to want to understand what the what the hell is going on, just because this craziness um, just doesn't seem to end, and we don't seem to have really an answer for it, as well. And so, you know, so the the book built builds on that that finding that we inhabit different worlds, and so then it then it asks the question: How can we get people to to see see each other if they're inhabiting the different worlds? And you know, I I like to ask the question to my students: You know, what data or what facts could change the mind of a bigot or a xenophobe? Or if you think immigrants are inhuman or if black lives don't matter, you know, what could I possibly tell you? What data could I possibly show you to make you think otherwise? And I think we all know the answer to that is that again, the point isn't that we're all of different opinions. We we inhabit different worlds. And we have a we have a there's a term for this in the literature. It's referred to motivated reasoning as a is an overly simplistic way of thinking about it. But what motivating reasoning tells us, and there's decades of research that backs this up, is that often we use facts um, to, we, we filter our facts, right? There's different ways in which we filter information that comes to us. Um, we either seek out the facts we want to hear, or if we're prevented, presented with facts that disagree with what we believe, we filter those facts out. And so I like to refer to this one very well-cited study that looks that analyzes climate change survey data from, from three populations. Um, it looks at the US public scientists act, actively publishing in that space um, and, and congressional policy advisors. And what they found is that the more knowledgeable people were to climate change inhabiting those roles, they're actually more partisan they became. And so this idea that just with more knowledge, we can we can come to some sort of Habermasian consensus, the, the data just simply don't back that idea up. And so I guess what I'm trying to interrogate then is how do we actually get people to, to believe that change ought to happen and how can we get people um, to, to, to come to some sort of common understanding? Um, because we realize that I mean, the, the, if the thesis is that knowledge alone doesn't do it, then what what can? And we can point to exa really interesting examples in the U.S., for instance, where we have rabid, rabid's too strong of a word, or it's a partisan word, but we have these cultural war warriors as we, as we talk about them, the Pat Buchanans of the world who see the world in very black and white terms, who suddenly maybe had a loved one in their family come out. And now suddenly they're open to the idea of gay marriage, or there's this great story of a, of a radical rightist populist German politician who is anti-Islamic to the bone and started to spend time with, with Muslims and suddenly con and then converted to Islam. And so I, I, I want to understand if these, what I refer to as these headland encounters, if knowledge doesn't cause people to have a change in attitude or understanding, what does cause people to do this? And I, I talk about the metaphor as, as a change of heart that there's some sort of, there's an embodied, the, the importance of an embodied relational experience, either with socially othered people or in ways that allows them to un better understand socially othered people, um, come, allows them to have this particular change of heart. And so I, I wrap it all together by showing about a dozen different experiments that I conducted using food as a way of showing how food actually might be, food has this interesting quality in that it actually can can disarm people so that they they, they, they're not immediately elbows out when they interact with others and can cause people to have some really interesting, authentic relationships with people that they wouldn't otherwise have, thanks to motivated reasoning. But so for some reason, food kind of short circuits that. Yeah, I love this. I love that idea. And, it, you know, I love, too, that it's sort of a nod to 
um, and historic idea together at the table, I'm thinking, right, and, and other, other books and other food study scholars who talk about the convening power of food and how important food can be as a, as a convening device. And so, yeah, I, I, I love that argument of your book. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, or maybe we can both talk about um, publishing very, very quickly sort of advice, the kind of behind the scenes in the spirit of this informal yes. talk. And then we'll turn it to the audience. You know, so this is like what now, number 13 book? <laughs> and you have over 200 articles? He shrugs. So I, I wanted to give people a sense of, or I want you to tell us how the heck do you do all of this? And, and I know one of the behind the scenes answers to that question, which is, can you tell everyone at what time you get up in the day <laughs> to write? All right. I do get up rather early. I get up usually around four o'clock in the morning, seven days a week, so I can get my work done. Though that comes with a caveat, then I, I often cash out mid to late afternoon and that becomes family time and I take care of my kids in the afternoon. And so I have an agreement with my spouse. And so it's not just me, it's a, it's a team effort in that respect. But um, <laughs> um, consistency in the seven days a week is really important. Writing every day kind of, yeah, I, I just right. know there are some, I see some of my students um, actually in the, in the audience. And I just, you know, looking at your CV, Michael, can make anyone feel a bit badly about themselves. And so I think that's a neat behind the scenes, <laughs> you know, Michael Carolyn gets up at, uh, at, at, with it before the sun in order to write. And so, and you write every day. So get up yes, early, carve out time day. for yourself and write every day is maybe one of the tips. But I also wondered about, um, maybe we don't have time to get into details about publishers, but okay, maybe we'll turn it over. I'm getting prompted now behind the scenes to turn it over to the audience. So maybe <laughs> we'll, we'll do that. Are there, any, are there any questions from audience members for either Michael, Carolyn or myself? I know, Michael, I think you had a question for me about or we were going to talk about digital agriculture and our work together and, and, and maybe my book. So if there are no questions, you can ask me a question. But oh, no. Oh, David is saying, feel free to type your questions if you feel too shy to use the mic. And if you don't have a question, maybe Michael will ask me a question. Well, if nobody has a question, I would like to honestly know more about your book, Kelly, because I, I know about it at some level, but I would like to hear more about it, especially since it's coming out. Well, don't say that. Knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any other questions. Yeah, so I have this book that's contracted. Oh, and we do have a question. Okay, so I'll just really quickly answer your question, Michael. Um, that's contracted with McGill Queens University Press, and it's on digital agriculture um, broadly, but actually I was thinking what would be useful to talk about in front of the students, which is maybe very briefly the process of putting the book together. Cause as you know, a few years ago, when I told you I was starting this book, I had a really simple research design, which is, I had this hunch that there were these two models for digital agriculture. And for those of you listening, you may not know what that is, but it's the use of sophisticated sensors, computing, the use of data analytics, and even artificial intelligence in food production and actually across the food supply chain. But I'm really focused on agriculture um, in this book and in my scholarship. But yeah, so a couple of years ago, I had this hunch when we presented at Data Power that there were these kind of two models for the realization of and this was is reflected also in some of your early publications, right, for digital mm -hmm. agriculture, that there was the John Deere and the Monsanto version. And then there's like the activist community, farm OS, farm hack, do it yourself, open data, um, ground up. And I thought, oh, isn't this interesting? Maybe there are these two very different contexts for production and they have very different relationships for power in the food system and for sustainability. And so I interviewed people in both of those broad communities, both designers and farmers and activists, but it was actually, and so this is the part for the students, after you know, a year and a half of interviewing, I coded all my data and I noticed that there were differences for sure, right? Different visions for what counts as a good food system, regenerative agroecology um, and you know, productivist, industrial, monocropping, export oriented, and different visions of good digital tools, right? Open data and um, the wide sharing of data. And, and then on the other side, right? Concentrated data, expertise for hire on the part of corporations, limited data access, et cetera. 
And, and yet when I coded the data, and so this is for the students, I really had to put down the clipboard because I realized, oh, you know, I was thought I was writing this really simple comparative analysis. And actually I noticed something that both communities share, which is a vision of, um, a vision of data um, that actually I think circulates far beyond the agricultural system. And so I developed this framework in the book uh, called the Immaculate Conception of Data. And it's that I see that there's this very widely held vision that data are raw and that they're all powerful and that they're gonna sort of save us no matter where you think they're gonna take us, it might be very different places, this idea that data are unmediated. And I think it has kind of political consequences, including for the realization of sustainable food systems. So the book is broadly about that. But another way to put it is the book is really about trying to get people to read Monsanto like they do Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happens when big tech meets big ag? Um, and what are the politics there? Because I think a lot of people like our data power experience shows aren't really paying attention to the Monsantos as big tech companies, but a lot, I would say almost the majority of environmental data now are, are being collected by private corporations with serious consequences. So that's the book. But I see now we have like two pressing questions. So yep, and related questions too. They are, okay, Heidi have you read them? Do you wanna read them out? Yeah, or, sure. Or a version, it looks like, yeah, they're. Well, since Heidi said that Teresa's a framing um, as, as more eloquent, I'll just read Teresa's, but being okay. an activist scholar, being a full two full-time jobs, um, I'm curious about how you do both and if you feel more of your time, energy, thought sits in the scholar part of that or an activist part of it. I mean, that's a great question. I'll, I'll let Kelly have a chance to answer that too because it's really important, but I have a, I have a lot of th thoughts on that, but I'll just mention three um, because it's really important. So there's different ways that I could try to inhabit that space as, as a scholar, scholar activist. Um, one is I try to find ways in which to help assist activists and help assist them represent, because you know, for better or for worse, the world we inhabit rests on representations and, and politicians and policymakers use those representations to make decisions. And we're often butting up against representations, the easiest, um, one of the easiest forms of representation of all is money, right? I work a lot with ag ag agricultural ecologists and they're able to put their world in a very simple black and white terms, the almighty dollar. And if we wanna be able to talk about what is important to a community from an activist standpoint, it's often more than just money. But the problem with that is that that more than is the things that cannot be easily represented. And so I help activists talk about represent either in, in numerical terms or in, in through words or through heat maps even, talk about those aspects of the world. What, and we could reduce it to social capital or cultural capital, although I know that's very instrumental, but I try to help activists come with tools so that they can be engaged in those conversations that really need representation to be able to have power and influence in those spaces. Um, the other thing I do is I, I, I think it's really important to understand human behavior and how social movements work. I think a lot of people inhabit that space, but that's very important. We have to understand why people do what they do and what makes one social movement more successful than another. And then the last one is, I think it's really important as scholars, as scholar activists to tell stories. And the, the thing that we're butting up against, unfortunately, is that we live in a society, I'm, I'm, I'm brushing with very broad strokes now, but we live in a society that, that, in, that appreciates or needs or expects sound bites and tweets and expect, expects kind of silver bullet narratives of the law, along the lines of better living through chemistry. But what we've realized is that the real solutions when it comes to food equity and food access and food sovereignty are not silver bullets, right? They're not, there's no grand narratives out there that work. The green narrative was, was a myth. What works is our localized experiments that are rooted to place, to culture, um, to economic power structures. And so what that means is that we just can't say X, Y, and Z will, will solve our problems. We have to come at it by talking about the, 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 the multiple stories that are out there of where things are working and help people understand that what works in one place may not work in another. That's not a bad thing. Um, and so I think telling stories is actually a very powerful tool as well. And it also gives people hope. 
it gives my students hope when they see examples of not just doom and gloom, but they see examples of things actually working on the ground, which I think is a way of, of empowering the younger generation to actually want to make a difference because then they actually believe that they can make a difference, which I think is really an important in and of itself. So Kelly, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, <laughs> what he said, I guess in part, but I just wanted to, um, I'll say more, but I wanted to say, so who was that? Teresa and Heidi had a similar question, but I wanted to first validate you, Teresa, when you say that you feel that you're not doing enough. Um, I want to, I mean, I'm, I'm making assumptions about your gender identification, which is hazardous, but I think that's a very, sorry, Michael, but I think that's a very female response to, to feel, I said to someone the other day, I feel like I'm doing more than is humanly possible. And yet I feel like I'm on the I'm I'm never doing enough, right? I feel like I'm on the brink of burnout and I feel like I'm not doing enough and how can both be true? And so I think we have to look sociologically, right? Or systemically at that feeling. And I think there, it's often a very gendered response because of, you know, systemic forces at play like patriarchy. Sorry, Michael, not to leave you out of this, but, um, and I wanted to just actually put a, a, a book link or title in the chat because I read this really interesting book last year on, Kind of patriarchy and and that feeling that you have that you're not doing enough um so i don't know if that would be helpful just some, which is totally i know tangential to what you asked the you know being an activist and a scholar i think michael you know you kind of said it you, before you said i'm sort of in a position where i can do this interventionist work right um i'm pre-tenure because i made the potentially unwise decision to move jobs um just after getting tenure um but but I think I'm sort of I've, I'm sort of fed up with critical understood in terms of just looking at what's wrong and not intervening. And I'm really interested to to use my scholarship to answer your question, Teresa, as activism. You know, when I was a student, I did more on the ground activism, kind of boots on the ground, right? In Toronto, food activism. And I just don't. I have a family. I don't have time to do that and scholarship now. So even though it's not totally rewarded and maybe not wise pre-tenure to do the kind of interventionist community-oriented activist -y work, right? Because it doesn't always lend itself easily to publications. It's not always, it's so time consuming. It's not, you know, enabling communities to, to set the, the course for a research project is time consuming. It doesn't lend itself easily to the kind of efficiency machine that is the current university system. Um, I've, I'm, I'm kind of fed up with critical understood in the you know, hands off non interventionist perspective. So I guess my answer to you is I'm what I'm sort of committed to do increasingly is, to doing increasingly is using my scholarship um, as activism. And what does that mean? That means, you know, doing community oriented research and other people, colleagues of mine in this food studies community in the Canadian Association for Food Studies do this better. Like I'm thinking of my close colleague, Irina Konechevich, who does participatory action work. Um, yeah, on and on. We all know, you know, all know who's doing that work. But I'm increasingly interested in doing that and using my scholarship as intervention or as activism. I'm working on a project right now, and David Santos helping me with a little part of it. And he said to me the other day, "It kind of sounds like what you want to do with this project is a reality TV show where you put um, policy actors on farms and see on small and diverse farms, and let's see how they do." Right? It kind of sounds like a reality TV show. Um, and so that's the kind of intervention is telling the stories, as Michael said, letting communities drive the research, what are the community needs and, and how can I fulfill them with my research projects, and then getting, you know, using interventionist methods like placing policy actors on farms to try to change perspectives, to try to actually intervene in the world, to change stories, to change assumptions. Okay, oh, David is saying there's a question. Um, Maybe so in embodied food politics. So maybe this, this is for you, Michael. You talk about the power of the mundane. Can you talk about how troubling what categories, what we categorize as mundane enables powerful activism and scholarship? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. Um, you know, first of all, I, I want to think about how do we how do we think about mundane? Um, and I, you know, root it back to kind of public private distinctions and you know thinking about actions that fall outside of the market or fall outside of traditional political channels and so you know this gets to the point of how it's not enough to be say a citizen consumer this is something we talk about all the time is that 
we can't change the world just by buying different stuff, right? And we equally can't change the world by just voting into office and engaging in traditional Western liberal politics in, in traditional electoral terms either. And that, you know, that encompasses then a whole aspect of potential forms of practices that fall outside those two realms. And, you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes. Um, I, I think it's, it's a bit um, status and lead, elitist to talk about engaging in activism in particular ways when you realize the real time constraints that people are under in the world. Um, and so I think mundane, what, what mundane politics looks like can look very different depending upon the lived experience of an individual. I mean, I think for me also, you have to think about mundane in the scholarship sense too. Um, you know, scholars, public scholars, um, might be or have been criticized for engaging in mundane scholarship or pedestrian scholarship just for even engaging in the study of around food or engaging in this type of scholarship that we're talking about because it's not armchair. It's about, it's about getting out in the world and engaging collectively with activists in participatory ways. And so I think it's really important we think about mundane in lots of ways and realize that the concept of mundane is very similar to the concept of say being civilized too. And I think embracing the, the concept of mundane is itself a, a, a way of shaking up power structures and it opens up new ways to engage in political action that fall outside the market or politics as typically understood. I mean, that's this is a whole hour conversation or more so than that's just a, a one minute way of trying to answer a, a, a wonderful question that's very hard to answer concisely. That's why you wrote a whole book around it. Um, I don't know if people know too. There's a you know a, a great um, essay from a book by Warren Belasco called "Why Study Food," right? And he sort of talks about some of the disciplinary bias, right, historically that that um, led to the marginalization of food studies, right, and and just sort of what biases why that circulate outside of um, the academy around food as mundane, right, as intimate, and who studies food? That's not a serious object of inquiry. But I mean, as you as you mentioned, you know, in your new book, like food actually, because of its intimacy, can be quite transformative. Um, maybe it is the transformative vehicle. I mean, words um, and food, food and words, as Raymond Williams tells us in that great little book, Keywords. Right, the word cultivation um, has its history in in agrarian roots, and and there's some, there is something fundamental about food and words. Um, I think. Um, I, so I don't know if that question was supposed to be anonymous, but David, you didn't answer me. I want to call out the person who asked it and I want to acknowledge, um, not anonymous. Okay, great. So I don't know, Wayne, if you know, um, Wayne Roberts, but that the question came from Annika Roberts Dahlbren. Um, sorry, Annika, you have an uh, identity all your own, but I just wanted to do a shout out to your dad. Speaking of activism, you know, there are people who have changed on the ground, the, the food and specifically food policy landscape in Canada and Wayne, um, Wayne Roberts is a hero in that regard. So I wanted to call out, call that out. Oh, hi Wayne. <laughs> He's loving this. He's probably really embarrassed now and mad at me, but anyway. Um, so, so what else can, we've talked about words, we've talked about representation, we've talked about on the ground politics and intervention. Um, yeah, we've talked about Monsanto as the new Facebook. Stay tuned. Hopefully my book comes out in 2021. What else? Any other questions? Oh, and so Teresa, sorry, I didn't mean to put words in your mouth. She clarified. She doesn't think she's doing not enough. Oh, that's good. Sorry, I inferred. You think you're doing too much, but spreading mediocrity. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I think scholarship, and again, not to, this is a whole hour long conversation. You know, I think sort of the academic engine can kind of, in some ways, breed not mediocrity, but armchair, right? Politics. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you do that kind of interventionist scholarship? And how do you have it still count as scholarship? You know, actually, Wayne, this is going to be embarrass you again, but at the end of my PhD, Wayne, I was in a very um, theoretical program at York University, and I got mired in other people who were, who were really writing kind of high theory. And, 
And it wasn't until people like Wayne said, you have to write more democratically. And that's the language he used that I realized that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in changing the world in working with people and in writing in an accessible way. And so one thing I appreciate about a lot of your writing, Michael, and I try to aim for this is big ideas, right? And transformative ideas, but accessible writing. Um, so maybe that's another answer to your question, Teresa, that it's not always rewarded in the academy, but if you can aim for kind of big transformative ideas, you know, interventionist scholarship and writing accessibly, then that's maybe a, one answer to your and question. I, I might also add on that point too, you know, in addition to being a scholar activist, I'm also regrettably a scholar activist administrator. And so I very have proudly have tried to spill my scholar activism into how I think about the research and creative artistry enterprise in my particular college, given that I oversee it. And with the help of my Dean, we spent the last two or three years going around to individual departments and having them change their code to recognize what we would call engaged scholarship and have conversations about, okay, if peer review is the gold standard, what would a peer review process look like for a scholar activist, for instance? Maybe it's not going to somebody at another peer institution, maybe it's going to, to community organizations where people have grounded knowledge of what it is you study and how it makes the world better. And that could be fed into your evaluatory process. So to encourage, as opposed to discourage a particular type of scholarship that historically has not been valued in the academy is, is just something else I don't think we talk enough about in the academy in terms of ways in which we can actually reward the type of scholarship that we know historically is under-recognized. Yeah, absolutely. And I just put in Dora, but I'm going to find the link. <laughs> the So I also sit on, I'm not you, I'm not an administrator and I have much less power than you do, Michael, but I'm trying to do the same kind of thing. Actually, funny enough, I sit on a research committee at the University of Ottawa that decides on all of the big research chairs. And I'm trying to shift the standards we used for adjudicating research toward by taking a feminist lens and this group in the University of California system and the um, standard they've set up is called DORA and I'll find a link, but it's these alternative metrics, right? Beyond peer review, beyond impact factor um, that, that, that make space for feminist research, for participatory action research, for interventionist scholarship. And it's no surprise that, you know, feminist scholars have been leading the way on this um, front for years and years and years, but, oh, great. Thanks, David. David oh. found it. it. That might be helpful for you, Michael. I don't know. Um, okay. So we have, oh, David has a question, but actually Sarah Louise also asked a quick question, which is how do we integrate activism and approaches or these gambits into teaching? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think when I think about that, it's helping bring to bear, it gets back to some of the ways in which I see myself as blending scholarship and activism. I know with a lot of what some of the classes and other classes that are performed by other scholar activists in my university, um, they engage and that typically looks like very participatory type of research where we go out and, and essentially ask community organizations or activists what do you, what not, tell us a research question you need answered or tell us data or tell us something that you need represented to help you to create leverage so that we can create change or to get your organization, have a successful grant proposal or something like that. Tell us reaching out and, and having groups tell us what they need and seeing then if we can kind of incorporate scholarship in a way that balances out making change through helping organizations that need the type of ex expertise and um, that we're trying to generate here. So trying to create participatory opportunities, I think for my students is, is one way that I found really successful and really rewarding and really also creates optimism in students when they can actually get firsthand knowledge of engaging it with community members in ways that seems actually impactful and, and meaningful. Yeah, I would have answered the same thing. So it used to be called service learning, right? And I, right. <laughs> the position I left, the tenure position I left was at a, a liberal arts institution. And what I did largely was service um, learning with my students. So finding opportunities in the community where they could do scholarship that helped service a community organization, for example. And now we call it engaged scholarship. Um, but yeah, that's one route that I, that I take in my teaching, in my supervision, I, you know, participatory action research, and for those people who are maybe listening who do this better than me or more than me, like Irina, 
right? It takes a long time to set up those relationships and to, to, to have it at the, have the research design at the place where a student who's doing a two-year master's, for example, can actually intervene, right? And still graduate <laughs> in a timely fashion and not take on mountains of debt, for example. So I try to support my students by having research projects, not ready to hand, because of course, you know, students um, need to develop their own ideas and autonomy, but, but having some, some sort of opportunities ready having data sets ready for students to work with. Um, and then of course, trying to fund students in as many ways as I can, <laughs> which means I, I do, you know, interestingly, some of the community or some of the participatory or community oriented work that I do is actually because I'm in the capital city. In fact, maybe most of it now is with policy makers. Mm. So, you know, um, with Agriculture, Agri-Food Canada, or I just finished a project with Treasury Board Secretariat, or I've done projects with Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, where they come to researchers, right, and they say we have this research need. And, and, I, and I think of that as a kind of community-derived research project, right? Um, and, but, but I, you, I say yes to those opportunities, not because I need more research projects, because I absolutely don't, but because those are op unique opportunities for me to fund students to do work that has some kind of real world relevance. It's not community exactly, it's policy community, but it's still, I think kind of activisty in a way, if you think of policy as one really important lever for shifting things, right? There's of course, you know, the boots on the ground, but um, there's also, I think um, an important place for shifting policy perspectives and that landscape. David, you had a question. Um, and at the beginning, we were talking about how it's important for critical food scholars not to just stand up there and be critical and negative, but also offer it to the students, particularly undergraduate students who are all sort of excited about food, but also unsure and are being faced with these really major challenges that we're all dealing with in our, in our worlds individually and in our worlds more broadly as societies. And I find myself offering students specific examples about what I think they might want to do, but I would love to know from the two of you, when you were talking, particularly to undergraduate students who are becoming like the biggest population in the potential future of food studies community, um, who we want to encourage to get engaged, and we want to encourage to be participants and take action and not just go overwhelmed and also not think that they can, in air quotes, solve the food system. Um, we want them to be, get some traction in a way that is accessible to them with a relatively early educational history. What would you recommend to us as teachers or to them as students, as undergraduates, a couple of little things that they might do to begin their pathway towards being an activist academic, being an activist, being an academic, being an artist, being an engaged scholar, being someone who's gonna to contribute to the change without thinking they're gonna make the change. <laughs> I feel like that's a million dollar question. <laughs> and we could have a whole debate about things like, I don't know. So right now I'm teaching a 100 and <laughs> 186 student undergraduate course um, in sociology of food and eating uh, or food ways uh, to use the David Edge concept. But, and I find that a lot of students get really excited about the ideas and then they want to live those ideas, which is just great, right? So, so you know, I've given um, links, for example, in the chat, because I'm teaching virtually right now, to the farmer that I support, to the CSA that I participate in, to, you know, the community um, garden that I, that I help support financially, to, you know, activist organizations. And, but then there's a whole debate we could have about to what extent does voting with your fork, to, you, to use a Marian Ness, Nessel um, concept, like that, to, to what extent does that feed into say the individualization as opposed to the, um, to the taking a food studies perspective, right? You know, to what extent am I then um, feeding this idea that, that, that people can actually, that we can change the system by our purchasing behavior alone. And so I think it's, you know, both giving students those little opportunities to grab onto lifestyle change um, to inspire them to do so through my own behavior, maybe in my teaching, but also helping them remain critical about the fact that these are systemic problems and, and, and then just giving them resources to think systemically about food system issues, I think can be really inspiring. And I don't know, maybe turn some students on to, I've had stu two students actually in the last couple of weeks say, one student actually is that doing an undergrad in biology and she said to me, I didn't know there was such a thing as food studies. And 
that you could think from this broad perspective and maybe she'll go on to to do to be a scholar <laughs> to do some of this activist oriented scholarship or to work in policy and use that as a lever or a mechanism for change that was a bit of a meandering answer to your question but i would say no, like encouraging students at both of those levels but maybe that didn't yeah what were you going to say michael no well i mean i was going to echo your me meandering kelly so i will <laughs> will not go do that since you already did it but I think I'll also add, this also kind of begs an interesting question that I've been grappling with, and it's something I grapple with in my, my uh, forthcoming book too, is, is it, what does it mean to engage people in food for ways that initially might not be the right reasons, but if it results in transformation, could the means justify the ends? And so what I mean by that is, what if, and I think about this with, and I see this with my students as well. And talk, like Kelly talked about trying to give them as many opportunities as possible. That's my argument for the value added when I talk to parents and prospective parents and prospective students is they could come here. We can, we can uh, engage them with people through my networks, through um, Colorado State Extension, which can connect them with communities throughout the state. They can have research opportunities. Um, but for students who maybe are still trying to find them, their feet and figure out who they are, who they are um, maybe the incentive for them is just to get an independent study or what they might consider as an easy grade. Um, but then once they're actually in that space and interacting with community members, I have seen many people transform from being people who are apathetic and are doing something because they're just getting credit for it. Um, and it's way to, maybe a way to make some money over the summer to actually being meaningfully changed as a result of some of these experiences. And so, um, you know, we have lots of debates about whether nudging is good or bad. And, you know, at, at, in the short term, it's problematic. But sometimes I've also discovered that getting people to do something for reasons that might not be entirely selfish might result in people who actually become more selfish and more empathetic than they were starting out in the process. And so I'm just trying to think through what that all means as well. And where incentives play in trying to think about basically the whole issue about human behavior again. So. Yeah, you know what, you, that, wasn't, that was a good addition, Michael, because I sort of mentioned opportunities to shift individual behavior, right, in ways mm -hmm. that students may be, and that's a big part of university learning, right, um, and modeling that behavior, or, although I feel like I could do more, um, and I used to do more, but, but, uh, but also, and then, and then giving, the, as, as David sort of rephrased in a nice way in the, in the chat, right, the name food studies and, and, and encouraging people to think systemically about food issues. But you added one, which is giving them opportunities to intervene in a kind of either through service learning, which we talked about before. You know, for example, this fall, I got a bunch of students on a bus and we, we helped a farmer harvest pumpkins <laughs> because there was this like, um, dire, you know, we know that labor um, supply has been an issue in COVID times, and there were a bunch of pumpkins that were going to rot in a field. And I just gave that opportunity to students, do you want to get on a bus with me and we'll go harvest pumpkins. And it's turned into basically a short term work and also volunteer opportunity for two separate students. So um, that's sort of one maybe addition to your addition. Um, Thank you, Michael. One cast member said, "If you we have this magic lure to attract people, yeah, food exactly, which comes back to the idea that idea of food, given its intimacy and its universality, right? It's sort of paradoxical. Both a really intimate object um, to also nod to another Canadian food study scholar, Anthony Winson, and also our intimate commodity is the name of his book, but also a really universal. It's a universal, right? Um, well, for those people fortunate enough to have access to food to eat." Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up then. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. That was great, um, Kelly and Michael. That was a really engaging conversation. I can't believe how much ground you covered in um, such I feel a like short. We could have talked for hours, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I certainly learned a lot, and I imagine the other audience members did too. So thanks again on behalf of CAFS, and um, I hope to see more of you on these webinars. Thank you, everyone. For thanks, everyone. Attending.